All right, we're going to pick up where we left off last week and get through that content and start into the week two content and see if we have how much of that we can get done today. Because uh, that very first set of slide decks is so thick that it's a little absurd uh, to try to get through in one class. So it always causes a bit of a snowball effect. Uh, the good news is because you have two weeks to do all the labs, it's not like you're losing any time towards work you're doing. So it's all good. Or at least no need for panic. I guess not necessarily all good, but no need for panic. All right. So last week we left off, ta left off, bah, damn words. Uh, we left off talking, uh, just before I started talking about relationships, and specifically um, in database design, there's three kinds. There's one-to-one, -one, and that means that each entity in a relationship will have exactly one related entity. Um, there's one to many, which is 95% of relationships once you're done doing design. Um, basically it's an entity that has many child records. So one to many, um, a quick example in this room is as a prof, I have many students. You have one database prof. Many to many. Uh, and that's when entities on both sides of the relationship can have many interrelated um, records on either side. Um, a good example of that would be students and courses. So students have many courses and each course has many students. So that's many to many. Now, one to one and one to many can be designed physically. Many to many needs to be resolved. Uh, I'll be discussing that in a bit um, because database servers cannot do many to many. Uh, they used to allow it uh, before they started really enforcing the rules. And it was always a bad idea. So, all right. So we have the three kinds of relationships and there are actually more than three type degrees of relationships. However, uh, we have the unary relationship, which is a relationship for a, for a table that relates to itself. So a self-referencing table. A binary relationship, which is what is the absolute most common relationship you'll see, is when there's a relationship and there are two participants in it. Ternary, there's three. And at one at that point, pretty much all the pocket protectors decided that they're going to stop trying to give names to degrees of relationships because it's entirely possible to have four, five, six relationships that all feed into a single entity. So they went ternary. Now nah, we're done with trying to come up with more names. Yes, they'd be quaternary and centenary and, you know, on and on and on. But honestly, it got kind of stupid at that point. So they just gave up. Um, but. The most common ones you'll see is the binary relationship where two entities are related to each other and a story. Um, in the previous slide, I was talking about many to many. The many to many ends up being a ternary relationship because you have one relation connected to two other things. All right. Just so you have a visual, um, the unary relates to itself. And the way they drew that diagram is really stupid because that should be a blue a blue line with that should be that should not be two boxes. That should be a box the line pointing to itself. Um, a binary relationship, basically two entities are participating. Ternary, there's three or more, uh, four or five, take your pick. I, a good example because I literally taught this topic yesterday, and my students made me dig until I came up with a really good example: the joys of level ones. The perfect example that you should all understand is course sections. Now, you guys come from a slightly smaller program, so you don't tend to experience the whole course section as much as the computer programmer and the engineer and technology kids. But when you think about how course sections are organized in the school, you will have a professor, you have a room, you have a student, you have uh, a course, you have a term. And you take all that, blend it together, you end up with a course section, which says this course is meeting with this prof, with these students in this room during this term. So 
when you get past ternary, they don't even have a name for it. But it's it's a complex relationship. Well, absolutely. Uh, they just stopped giving it fancy names. So a unary relationship is an entity related to itself. Most of the time, you'll see these in an environment that has that has um, like a tree-like environment. So you have an employees table, and I'm going to go shut some doors. Okay, so unary relationship tends to be found in uh, a table structure that builds a tree. A good example of that is uh, an employee's table where you have employees, managers are also employees, the manager's manager is also employees. Therefore, an employee, man an employee is managed by another employee. That employee could be managed by another employee. So essentially the way it goes is, um, at the top of the tree will be um, an employee that does not have a managed by. So that one's null. And after that, it just builds, it branches out. Uh, those of you past a certain vintage probably remember a website called Yahoo. And you remember in Yahoo, you'd click on a link and then it'd show you more links. Then you click on a link and it would show you more links. It worked the exact same way. They had categories. And categories were self-referencing so that each category could have multiple subcategories and each of those could have multiple subcategories. That's a, it's a fairly straightforward concept, but you know, a lot of people don't realize that it's a self-referencing table. So it's a unary relationship. A binary relationship is more along the lines of an employee that works in a department. So an employee works in a department, a department has employees. So in this case, um, the diagram is stupid because they did a one-to-one -one when they drew it. But essentially, as described, an employee works in one and only one department. And um, an employee can only belong to one department. But the way they also drew it is the department can never have, have one employee, which is kind of wrong. Um, but it's still the concept of unary relationship where Employee to departments, only two entities that are participating in that relationship. Now, employee could have relationships to other things. It could be related to itself. It could have uh, something else like projects or tasks or skills. However, when we talk about a binary relationship, we're just talking about a relationship that affects two entities. And then the ternary relationship is when you've got three entities that are related to each other. And the way they've got this set up is a professor teaches one of many courses. A student is taught by one prof. A prof can have many students and students can have many courses. And each course has many students, thus that. In the end, um, that will actually end up being four tables once you actually go to create the actual structure. But at the design concept, it's only three. So you've got the three entities that are participating and what kind of relationship happens there. When you, in the end, when you resolve this, you know, somewhat more complex relationship, you'd actually have another table here where all of these feed into. It'd just be a, third, a fourth table in this case. Here at the school, there's more than four tables. There's classroom, there's a section, term, et cetera, et cetera. So what we call, what this table in the middle right here would be for you guys would be a section. So for this course, you're in CST 8250, term 23W, section, 300, I think. So it's, you know, it's a little more complicated once you start going out past the examples, but this is an example of a ternary relationship. Realistically, you could add in a section number on this and suddenly you'd have 
no four-way relationship. So the next topic about relationships is cardinal cardinality constraints. Now, cardinality constraints is the number of instances that one entity can or must be associated with each instance of another entity. You have to be you actually have to pay attention to that particular phrase, can or must be associated. So this is where we start talking about whether or not a, a, a foreign key is mandatory or not, if it can be null or not null, uh, required or not. So when we think about cardinality, there are two items. There's the minimum cardinality and the maximum cardinality. The minimum cardinality is either, is either zero or one. Zero means it's optional. A good example of a zero type relationship is you've placed an order on Amazon. The order exists, but it has not yet been shipped. They have all kinds of shipping systems, you know, UPS, FedEx, whatever they choose to use, Canada Post, uh, Intel Com, lose your parcel company, you know, et cetera, et cetera. However, until the package ships, it and a shipping company has not been associated to that order. Therefore, the shipping company is an optional relationship. Once it's set, it's set, but until it gets set, it's optional. Therefore, its cardinality would be zero as an optional. A mandatory uh, relationship would be the minimum cardinality would be one or many. Um, usually it's one when we talk about the minimum cardinality. That means that it's mandatory. There must be a value there. A good example of this one is you go to Loblaws, grab a bunch of bananas. You pay for your bananas and a receipt comes out. Each item on your receipt must belong to a receipt. So it's mandatory that each item on your receipt has a receipt number. So you cannot have a receipt for something unless you actually have a receipt. If that makes sense to you. The maximum cardinality is the maximum number of things participating. And uh, that one, the maximum is either one or more. It's not like one, two, four, five. It's either one or more. So you end up with a combination of options here, which is zero or one, zero or more, one and only one, one or more. So you have four states for all of those which gives us our crow's foot notation. We have mandatory one. So you'll see it's done as two lines. So one and only one. That's how you can actually read that symbol. You have the next one here, which has a little circle in it, which means it's zero or one. One or more. Zero or more. Of course, one is always more than zero. Therefore, you can also read this last one here as a zero, one, or more. But often it just ends up being optional many. But if you want to talk about using the numbers, it's zero, one, or more. Now, if we look at the example below, you have a patient and a patient history. Now, the way you read this is each patient must have a patient history, at least one, and they can have multiple. So when you go to the doctor's office, the very first thing they do is they open up that very first record of your first visit. And at that point, you have a patient history the second you walked into that examination room. Each patient history has one and only one patient. So it's saying that every record in the patient history table can only ever belong to one patient and it must belong to one patient. Otherwise we have a patient history with no patient. That makes no sense. The other way around is the same thing. You can't really be a patient without some sort of history. Therefore you have to have at least one and odds are you're gonna have multiple. Uh, if anybody in here has ever spent more than you know six hours at the hospital, you've seen how your file grows really, really fast. At one point, my wife was in the hospital four days, her file was that thick after four days. 
that all got digitized at the end, but you know, she had many records on that, that one visit. Um, so that's how you'd read that sim those that set of symbols. Um, another example here would be a flight with flight attendants, uh, one to many uh, mandatory relationship. So Air Canada Canada one two three has a you know a flight attendant of Joe LH. Four five six has Sue and Bob, and BA two three one has Alice and Tom. So the way this rule it would be read is a, the cardinality is minimum one, because legally an airplane cannot take off without a flight attendant. Yes. Yes, that's exactly it. You have to think about whether or not the rules make sense. So the rules are as follows. A, a flight has to have at least one flight attendant. Uh, any flight that has more than so many passengers, which I think is more than eight passengers, must have a flight attendant present. So that's just actually regulation that explains why the rule is set the way it is. And a flight can have a maximum of many attendants. In other words, we're not going to say this flight has a maximum of two. It means that it has to have at least one, and there could be more. Obviously, a small plane might only have, you know, like a Dash 8 might only have one flight attendant. Versus a, an A380 has probably got like 12, just because of the size of the plane. So, in the end, it's one. Mandatory, maximum is many, which would be map drawn as such. So each attendant can only be on one flight at once, which makes sense. Can't put the person on two different planes at the same time, unless you ask one of the American Airlines recently tried to do that, and that didn't go so well. Um, and each flight can have, must have at least one attendant and can have multiple attendants. So that's literally how you read those symbols. Uh, once you understand what the symbols mean, it's really start easy. It starts becoming easier to understand what the database is supposed to do. And here we've got an example of an optional relationship. So we got three profs, Bob, Sue, and Jim, and CST one, two, three, four, and five. Now, the cardinality is as follows. It's a minimum zero. In other words, a prof can exist, but not have any classes associated with them. Sabbatical, for example. They go on sabbatical, they have no courses. Maybe for a term, they decide he's not, the, the teacher's not going to teach a class, he's going to do course development. He's still considered as faculty, but he's not actually teaching a class. Each prof can teach multiple classes, and it's possible to have a class without a prof. It happens. Um, it happens pretty often here at Algonquin, actually. Uh, as a partial load, I get lots of emails about a week before the start of the term saying, we need someone to cover this course because, you know, they're having staffing issues or scheduling issues and they can't fit everybody's schedules based on the requirements. So suddenly they start asking the part-timers, can anybody fill in these courses? So up till that moment, the course exists. It has students, but it doesn't have a professor yet. It doesn't mean that it's never going to have a prof. It just means at that point in time, it's potentially possible that it won't have a prof. So how would you draw it? Just like that. So you'd read this as in the professor has zero, one or more classes. Each class has zero or one prof. So when you read the symbols, you draw, cut the line in half. The symbol on this side has to do with this entity. The symbol on this side has to do with that entity. And you'd read it from the source entity to the destination entity. So if you're reading from the prof, you ignore the first symbol. So you'd read it from here to here, you go zero or more. And from the class you read from here, go zero or one. So you read it from the source entity towards whatever it's connected to. And the symbol that touches wherever you're headed is the actual relationship for the one you're talking about. 
Um, that, from my experience teaching this, this is one of the concepts that a lot of people have a hard time grasping right away, is where the symbols apply. That because they see this here, they think this is the rule for the professor. No, it's the rule for the class. And the one at this end is the rule for the professor. So you go from the professor reading across the line. And when you get to whatever it is you're connecting to, you start reading from the, well, from this side to that side. And from the class would be from this side that way. Clear as mud. Yeah. OK. Um, I'm going to throw in a slide or two about naming conventions. Uh, that's literally the end of these slides, but I always, normally I try to cover that at the start of the term. Um, naming conventions. It used to be loose and free. Literally, no matter where you worked, everybody did it whichever way they wanted. Um, and I've worked for several corporations in my life. And I can guarantee that every company used to do it their own way. Each department would do it its own way. Often developers in the same department would do it their own way. So, you know, Python has a coding guideline that, you know, you follow certain rules and everybody's Python code looks the same. Java is the same. If you follow the Java um, naming conventions and programming style, your variables might not be called the same, but somebody looking at your code is not going to want to take a fork to their eyes because it's going to look the same. With database, for a long time, it was totally random. Um, originally when space was a, a premium, and trust me, today space is not a premium, no matter what you think, space is not a premium. When we have cell phones with, you know, 256 gigs of storage, it, you know, or memory card for your cam that's 128 gigs, space is not a premium. But way back in the day, space was a premium. Um, one of my summer jobs when I was in college was a janitor at the community college in my hometown. And by community college, it was actually a satellite campus. For those of you that don't know what that is, it's basically three, four rooms in a, in a building where students come in and the profs are remote. A bit like during COVID. But they have, they, this is a permanent fixture of this place. And they had this old computer. It was a VAX. Now, probably most of you don't know that phrase. It was a mini, what they called a mini computer. It was size about two of those tables. It also had a hard drive the size of this table, 20 megabytes. Not 20 gigabytes, 20 megabytes. The entire, they had a copy and they literally, they at the start of every term, a, a delivery truck would show up with tapes and they'd load up the student body for that term. And they needed the student body for all the courses that belonged to that campus, not just that location, but all the other campuses of that school. 20 megabytes is not very big. Just saying. I mean, my cell phone, that's what, four pictures on my cell phone? Or, you know, 10 seconds of video, depending on the size of the video you're doing. So people used to use some very cryptic naming conventions, like A1, A2, A3 for field names. Table being A, A1 being field one. And you'd actually have documentation that would tell you what these fields held. Thankfully, we don't do that anymore. Uh, each company had its own standards. Um, I've worked in a place where table names must be plural. Another place I worked at, table names must be singular. Primary keys are called ID. Table uh, or it's table name underscore ID. Um, and then, of course, each developer would have their own take on it, which was terrible. So it caused all kinds of grief. Um, when I worked for digital equipment, which became Compaq, which became HP, I inherited a database which had the original naming style of A1, A2, A3. I spent three months doing data analytics trying to figure out what everything was in that database because it made no sense. And in the end, after three months, I realized that that tape database made no sense anyways. Uh, all I could do is extract the data out of it and put it in something sane. But it took me three months to figure out how to get the data out in a way that it was actually usable. So it caused a lot of grief. Um, considering that we weren't dealing with 20 megabyte hard drives, there was no reason for it. He just liked doing it the old way. And when he left, took all the documentation with him. 
So yes, it was fun. So as development progresses and the speed of technology is increasing, uh, you may have noticed even in the last five years how much things have changed, even on the internet. There's something called the development framework. And hopefully you guys are gonna learn about at least one of them as part of your program. There's a de facto standard that's starting to emerge. So what a de facto standard means, it's basically a stand, it's a gentleman's agreement, as they used to call it, where it's not a written rule anywhere, but pretty much everybody agrees to, you know, one or two sets of rules, and basically most people follow them. There, there never will be. Not as long as there's some sort of revolution in the database in, industry. There's two almost identical standards, de facto standards, but if you go to the old data scientist types, they're still using naming conventions from 20 years ago because that's what their books they learned and said to do. Yes, it is. So I'm gonna use these naming conventions. Um, however, what the way I'm gonna grade you is these are the ones I prefer to see. If you don't use these, cool, as long as you stay consistent within the assign the task. So if you're doing Lab four, as long as you stay consistent, I'll be happy. I'll be fair because, you know, like I said, there's competing standards. So, but my preference is everything is lowercase, no exceptions, um, if possible. Why is everything lowercase? Um, depending on what database engine you're using, uh, it cares or does not care about case. MySQL is not case sensitive. PostgreSQL is insanely case sensitive. Microsoft SQL Server depends on where you've, what code page you're installed on. You install it in Latin one, it's not case sensitive, but you install it with some other co code page, it is case sensitive. So it depends on what code page. And then Oracle just lies. So Oracle stores everything you create with two different names. The version you typed in, and then everything in uppercase. But you never get to see the uppercase fields. It's hidden somewhere in the metadata. So Oracle lies. So if you make everything lowercase, it's guaranteed to work everywhere because lowercase is cool. Uh, never use spaces in object names. You're just making your life hard. Use an underscore. This should feel familiar for you guys because it's snake case, also in Python. If you use basically the same naming conventions as you do for your variables in Python, you shouldn't have a problem with this. Um, try to make your table names plural whenever possible. Um, exceptions would be names that imply plurality, such as log. A log implies multiple entries. It's not logs, uh, it's a log table. Um, which, you know, I've had students argue with me about that one because they say, well, is it person, people, peoples, persons? Because technically all four of those are valid. I'm like, just pick one. Just be consistent, stick with it. Um, I prefer if you call your primary keys just ID. And why would I say that's a good idea is it lets you abstract your code. So you're not gonna be writing any code against the database, but if you create every single table where the primary key is called ID, guess what you don't need to figure out in your code? What did I call that primary key? The object could be called employee, the primary key called ID, congratulations. It's a department, primary key is called ID. Doesn't make a difference, you can just go select star from whatever the object is where ID is equal to. Yeah, now you don't need to worry about what that primary key is gonna be called. Um, now, foreign keys is where things get a little weird, where uh, you get people that argue about the singular table name versus the plural table name is because of foreign keys. Now, the modern frameworks, and there's three or four big ones right now that are leading. Um, there's Cake PHP, Laravel, at least in the world of PHP, those are the two are two of the big ones, uh, Code Igniter. Uh, they all pretty much have the same standard. Uh, Microsoft basically has the same standard for their framework for C Sharp. So, you know, getting used to these is a good thing. So the foreign keys uses uh, what's called inflection. So it's a singular parent table name plus an underscore plus the primary key name. So if you have a table called users, and its primary key is ID, you know, if you're following that rule that's just above it, the foreign key would be user ID. 
the ID of a single user. Where do you find the user? In users. Because you have multiple users, but that ID belongs to only a single user. That's the logic behind that particular set of naming conventions. It is not the end all be all. So I'm not going to be super strict on this. However, as long as you stay consistent within your own work. So if you do one thing and then he does something else and she does something different, but as long as all your work looks the same, his all works all looks all the same and your work looks all the same, I'm going to be happy. I'm more worried about consistency than I am about nitpicking. So be consistent and I'll be happy with your work. All right, so that was, that was the end of last week. Yay. And we're going to pick up for this week. Dippers. All right, so today we're going to try to um, define the terms that have to do with ear modeling. Uh, we're going to describe the process of creating diagrams. Um, we might review relationships and cardinality, but considering we just finished talking about them, I'm probably going to skip those slides because why do it if I'm doing it twice in one day? And then um, discuss how to draw the a diagram and maybe discuss how to recognize attributes and relationships and cardinalities, basically lab two. Um, some of you have already started in lab two and you can get, like I discussed with some of the students yesterday, you can do task one and two, no problem. Task three, you can get through the first couple, but based on the knowledge you should have from last term, you can probably take a solid guess at the rest of the answers. Um, but we're going to get through that today, I hope. Okay. A database can be modeled, modeled as a collection of entities and the relationships among those entities. Um, a database systems are often, mod often modeled using ER diagrams, uh, relation entity relationship diagrams. It's basically a blueprint from which the actual data is stored. Um, it's basically the output of the design phase. And there's a couple different flavors of ER diagrams. However, an ER diagram allows us to sketch a database design. So if we're just talking about a conceptual diagram, which is the very first version, like, does anybody in here draw as a hobby or not? You know, when you draw, you kind of sketch out the scene or you sketch out the figure and then you fill in the details, right? It's it's the same idea with ER diagrams. You, you sketch out the database, you frame it up, and then you're going to fill in the details. Um, the example I used in uh, another class is um, there's... There's the conceptual, the logical, and the physical diagrams. And essentially, what that is, is the logical, I mean, the conceptual diagram is, you know, when you go, actually, most of you don't know this, you go to get a house built. They're not going to present you with a blueprint. They'll, you'll sit there with a the designer, and they'll do a rough sketch of what you think the house should look like. Then they're going to do a rough design, and then they're going to do blueprints, and then they build the house. This is the same steps. It's there's the ER diagram at the very first part, the logic, the conceptual one is a sketch. It's a rough outline of what the database should be. And then it gets refined as it goes through the process. So an ER model lets us sketch the diagram. It's a graphical tool. It's visual. You're not sitting there typing a bunch of words. You're dropping, at least at first, you're dropping a bunch of symbols on an editing tool. It's used widely in database design. Um, the conceptual diagram is starting to not be used as much as it used to be. Um, because scratch database work is not as common as it used to be. But it is a fantastic tool to explain to the layperson if you understand the data structure. Somebody might come up to you and say, we need to do a database for this. And they just throw out a bunch of words at you. So then you could sketch it with a conceptual diagram and say, this is how I understood what you're talking about. This, these are the objects, these are the relationships. Did I get the, do I have the right idea? And then you can use that as an initial design tool to make sure you got all the major pieces. Um, an ERD is a graphical representation of the logical structure of the database. And 
It also identifies the concepts and the relationships between those entities. So an ERD serves multiple purposes. The database designer, while creating these diagrams, will get a better understanding of the underlying data. The goal is, is you want to make sure the person that's designing the database actually understands the needs. Therefore, if they're taking the time to draw the diagrams, they're starting to develop an understanding. Um, it's similar to outlining. For those of you that remember writing us uh, uh, essays in high school, and one of the best ways to write an essay is to not start with, on this day, I wrote an essay about this. You actually create an outline of your essay, and then you start filling in the blocks. Uh, anybody who's ever done any kind of creative writing will tell you that's basically how you write a story, uh, or at least that's how you write a story properly. So it, does, it serves as a tool to help understand the data. It's a documentation tool. If there's diagrams and there's a paper trail, then things are documented. And in the end, the ERD is used to communicate the logical structure of the database to users. So you have a, a group of users that have a certain need. They discuss to you what you th they want. You diagram it, use the diagram to communicate with them to say, this is how I understand what you're talking about. So that's the three big purposes. So in the conceptual diagrams, we have four graphical symbols. We have the entity, which is a box. We have the relationship, which is a diamond. The cardinality, well, I showed you guys cardinality already, which is, you know, the crow's foot. And then we have the attributes, which are ellipses or ovals, depending on which word you want to use, not circles. They're oblong. Now, I'm going to quickly just say the titles here because I literally finished covering this a few minutes ago. But we have optional relationships, mandatory relationships, and the cardinality constraints. Describe them. Obviously, I just finished discussing that. Um, and we have the three kinds, which is why this second lecture goes quick if I do the second half the first time through, because we don't need to cover it again. Uh, just as a quick reminder, these are symbols. However, when we start talking about creating an ERD, you'll notice now we now have diamonds involved. And the diamond only has a symbol on one side of the line. Because if there's another entity on this side, it's going to have its own symbols over here. This is to say this is a relationship and coming from here to here, that's the rule on this side and there's a rule on that side. That's a junction between the two objects. So in the model, we want to, for example, we want to indicate that each school can enroll many students or may not enroll any students at all. That sounds kind of weird when you hear someone say that, that we could have a school with no students. But I'll use uh, the the middle school that was just down the street from where I live, J.H. Uh, Putman, if anybody in here recognizes that name. Two years after my daughter was finished going to that school, they shut down the school for students. It still exists. It's still used by the OCDSB, but there are no students enrolled there. It's used for as a training center instead for the teachers. But it's still a school, so it has zero students enrolled. Um, and then we're, let's say we want to indicate that each student attends exactly one school. Uh, we would draw it like this. Now, so far this is understood. However, if we were going to do this as a proper ERD, we'd have a diamond right in the middle here. So let me just redraw this really quick. Come on. Oh, come on. And where'd it go? Oh, 
All right, so by the way, this website's called erdplus.com. Um, is a, probably the best conceptual diagramming tool I've seen. Way better than draw.io and Visio. Why is it better? Because it's designed to make conceptual diagrams. And only conceptual diagrams, and it understands conceptual diagrams. So just to do what I was, that example they had, so we had, um, School, student, and then like such. And if we remember the rule that we had here where the student goes to one school, must be in one school. So we'd go um, yeah, yeah, this diagramming tool does does it really, really well. Um, and you can even put a word in that box so that it even makes even more sense. So if, let me just move this over a little bit so you can compare. The two and. Okay, I got it backwards, but uh, of course I have it backwards. Hang on, it's mandatory one. Optional many. It's because I got my boxes reversed from the diagram we have up there. But essentially, um, no, I had it right. I had it right. It's because I've got it upside down, it looks wrong to me. Go figure. Uh, so as this example here, and let me just, uh, there, let's make it the same. There we go. So uh, both of these are considered valid conceptual diagrams. However, the one with the diamond is considered more proper. This is where things like um, draw.io don't do a good job because it has a hard time with the whole diamond connecting to things because it wants to put the relationship rules in all kinds of places. And you end up having to fight the software instead of doing the design. Um, there are other diagramming softwares that are really good at this. Um, they used to give out a student version one called Toad Data Modeler. Um, then Dell bought it and killed the student power program, go figure. Um, power Designer from SAP, uh, used to be a company called Sybase that made it. Uh, they don't make a student version. The cheapest one's like $2,000. This one's free for students. You just sign up and you use it. So when you do that lab that gets you to create a conceptual diagram, ERD Plus is a really good place to use it because it uses the correct terminology for everything too. It has all the kinds of entities you'd expect, regular, weak, associative, and even a supertype. They're all there. It knows how to draw them so that you can actually say it's a weak entity and it'll actually draw it properly. If it's an associative entity, it'll draw it properly. So yeah, so that's an ER, a basic ERD. So the steps to create an ERD is you identify the entity. So last week we talked about entities, they're things. We identify the attributes. If we talk about students, name, date of birth, identification number, address, phone number, they're the, they're the attributes you'd use to describe the entity. Then you try to identify the primary keys or at least the identifiers or the candidate keys. You try to figure out what those are gonna be. You define the relationship between the entities. You identify the constraints and then you do an initial drawing and then you check it. So you do the drawing, you look at it. Usually it's when you wanna to talk to another person. If you're lucky, you have another person you can ask about your diagram so that you can do a proofreading, let's say. Um, because it usually helps to have a second set of eyes to check your work. If you don't have access to a second set of eyes, my recommendation is put it away for the day, go take a walk with the dog, go play some video games, go read a book, go do a puzzle, do something else to reset your brain and then go back and look at it again. So this is just, you know, arrows explaining the previous steps. And that's just, you know, a more detailed version of it. Um, so we're going to go through all of these steps 
and it's all one set of it's one long example from here on out. All right, so we have a block of text. And sometimes you will receive a written spec, written specification. I'm putting spec in quotes uh, because customers don't know how to write a spec. They will tell you what they think they want, but they won't actually tell it to you properly. So part of the design process is learning what the customer actually wants. So we got this uh, block of text. Now, if those of you that have the slide decks open in front of you, going forward, just stay on this slide so you can refer to this so I don't have to keep going back and forth. Um, a company has several departments. Each department has a supervisor and at least one employee. The employees must be assigned to at least one, but possibly more departments. At least one employee is assigned to a project when an employee may be on vacation, therefore not assigned to anything. The important data fields are the names of the departments, projects and supervisors, and the employees, as well as the supervisor and employee number and a unique project number. So we have this big block of text with all kinds of information in it. So what we do is based on this block of text, can we um, pick out the pieces? So first things first, we're gonna identify the, uh, the entities. And when we go through that paragraph, we want to identify each thing only once. So we wouldn't highlight department multiple times. We identified the first event of said department. So a company, has several departments. So we identified company, we identified departments. Each department has a supervisor and at least one employee. Employees must be assigned at least one, possibly more departments. At least one employee is assigned to a project. And suddenly there won't be any new words after this. However, a true entity should only ever have more than one instance. So when we think about it, a company is only once right? You work for a company, you wouldn't model the company you work for. You model the pieces of the company you work for. Therefore, there's many departments. And we also talk about how each department has a supervisor. That means if there's multiple departments, there has to be multiple supervisors. That's another thing we can map. And at least one employee. Well, most companies have more than one employee, unless you're like a private contractor. And assigned a project. Again, most companies have more than one project on the go at least companies that survive. So the next step is we want to identify the associations or the connections between the entities. And a simple method of doing this is using a relationship matrix. Uh, it's a table. And as you can see on uh, the high res image there, um, this concept has been around for a while. Specifically at this example, they used when I was in school. That's how much it has not changed, the process. So this is a 27-year-old example. Um, obviously, they, we didn't have nice projectors and slides back then. So you know, I kind of rebuilt some of these slides years ago. So we have something called a relationship matrix. This is something you actually don't, they don't teach very much anymore in a lot of database design courses, but it's a really useful tool. Um, every tool that helps you understand the data is a good tool. As you develop a lot of experience, some of these tools, you'd stop using them because you know you do it intuitively. But when you're first starting out, these are good tools. So we would go through each cell and we determine whether or not there's an association. So when we look at it, a department has no association to the department because it's itself. Nowhere in that paragraph did we talk about how there's a hierarchy of departments or a hierarchy of anything else. So Self to self grid has no value. Uh, department is assigned an employee or an employee is assigned to a department. A, a department is run by a supervisor, but nowhere is department and project ever mentioned together. If you go back to the paragraph and you read through it again, not once do we ever talk about how a department is associated to a project. Therefore, if the data wasn't given to you, you don't invent data. And then we can turn it around, go an employee belongs to a department. An employee is not connected to itself. An employee is not actually connected to a supervisor either because not once do they talk about supervisor and employee in the same place either. 
However, an employee does work on a project. A supervisor runs a department and no other time is that piece of information used. And again, a project uses an employee, but not once is project ever associated with supervisor, department, or obviously itself. So a lot of people will make assumptions based on their real world life experience and color their design. When you use something like this, it allows you to avoid bias. So this allows you to actually only work with the data that's been given to you and not manufacture. Now, of course, real world experience will color your designs. And one of the hardest tasks as a new database designer or database architect or whatever you want to call yourself is learning to recognize your own biases when you're doing this kind of work and avoiding your own biases. This is a tool that helps you avoid your biases. Once you've been doing it for 20 years, you tend to be able to pick up your own biases pretty quick. So we go through and uh, this just continues talking about the exact same thing. So, so we can take that grid and we turn it into a series of sentences. So a department is assigned an employee. A department is run by a supervisor. An employee belongs to a department. An employee works on a project. A supervisor runs a department. And a project uses an employee. So we took that grid and now we turned it into a set of rules. And this is basically business rules. So if ever somebody starts talking to you about business rules, those are business rules. We created business rules based on identifying the entities and how they're associated to other things. Obviously, there's more to it than that, but it gives you a good starting point for your business rules. Nice and simple, concrete, clear, no complicated words. Um, I don't even know if we talk about business rules at all in these slides. Um, but essentially, as a rule of thumb, when we talk about business rules, we want them to be atomic, as in they're self-contained. There's not more than one concept per rule. Um, they need to be uh, declarative, declarative. In other words, it is spoken in an active voice. It is clear, simple, and understandable. And the last rule of a business, a good business rule is uh, the average person can understand it. No computer mumbo jumbo jargon mixed into there. So you can go up to a manager and say, read these rules. Does that make sense to you? If your manager can understand them, good job. I like making fun of managers. My manager was actually scary smart um, before a company I worked for was bought out. He was actually a nuclear engineer. He went to school for like making nuclear reactors. He just said he didn't like glowing in the dark. So he went to software engineering. But, you know, even then, I had to give them rules this simple because sometimes it just didn't make sense to them, the world I looked at. So then we're going to take all the entities and we're going to slap them in rectangles. And then we're going to use the diamonds and lines to represent the relationships between the, the entities. So again, we got the student and the class. Student and class, and we can actually just put in enrolls in. It's taken by, and there should actually be a diamond right here. Um, so it would look like this. So we take those rules and we'd sketch them in like such. So an employee works on a project, a department is run by a supervisor, just like the sentences, but now we're turning them into, you know, boxes, diamonds, and lines. You'll notice so far, we don't have any cardinality put on here. That comes later. A department is assigned an employee. Um, this is just showing that you can actually make these lines go in any which way you want. Normally, they go horizontal and vertical. You try to avoid angles because diamonds aren't on an angle, then it's a box. So you try to keep it in line with the shape of the diamond. So if we take all the bits and pieces and connect them up. So we had department run by supervisor, employee works on a project, and we have department and employee. It ends up being like this. So we took that big paragraph of text and turned it into this. 
So right now we know a department is run by a supervisor. The supervisor runs a department. Department is assigned an employee. Employee is assigned to department. Employee works on a project while the project is worked on by an employee. So we took that big block of text and we turned it into something sort of understandable visually. So now that we have this, we got to fill in the cardinality. We're going to send in the rules of one to one, many to one, optional, that kind of thing. So each department has one supervisor. Each supervisor has one department. Each employee can belong to one or more departments. Each department must have one or more employees. Each project must have one or more employees. And each employee can have zero or more projects. If we go back and read through that block of text again, you can actually derive these rules. And then, and again, this is yet again another set of business rules. We're identifying the rules of engagement of how the data lives. So then we take up the four pieces of cardinality we know about. One and only one, one or many, zero or many, or zero or one. Using those symbols for the fifth time today, you've seen them. And this is also a repeat. We fill it in, it looks like this now. So we know that each department is run by one and only one supervisor. Each supervisor is in charge of one and only one department. You can't be a supervisor unless you're in charge of a department. Therefore, you have to have a department if you're a supervisor. And it does say that each department must have at least one supervisor. Each department is assigned one or more employees. Each employee is assigned to one or more departments. Each employee can work on zero, one or more projects, but each project must have at least one employee or multiple employees. So now we've taken that paragraph of text and we've now put in the cardinality rules so that it's visually understandable of what's happening. <clears throat> So just a few more examples where, you know, you can look at the different kinds of relationships. Now, the next step, <clears throat> we went past what they call a standard ERD, and there's something called an extended ERD, or an extended conceptual diagram. Most diagramming tools do not differentiate. They start you off with the tools to do the full, the full fat version of everything. However, if we go back two slides. Technically, this is an entity relationship diagram. When somebody says an entity relationship diagram, this is what they mean. However, a lot of people, when they say that, they actually mean something we're going to see in a minute past this, which is what they call an extended entity relationship diagram. It's extended because we're going to put on the attributes also. Therefore, it's a fully described ERD, thus it's extended. So the first step is we are going to put in our identifiers. Since the paragraph of text was so kind to tell us that we needed to track the department name, the supervisor number, the project number, and the employee number, they made it pretty clear that those were the identifiers. So when you draw it on the diagram, you use the ellipses, the circle, the oval. But if you mark it as an identifier, it's underlined. So let me just go back to that uh, diagramming website really quick. So if I were to throw on an entity on here and I'm gonna go, uh, I'm gonna add an attribute for it. And of course it went off the screen. And we're gonna call the student number. And by the way, at this stage, naming conventions are not important. You just use whatever you want. Naming conventions is when you do the physical side. And we know it's the um, unique, also known as identifier. It becomes underlined. If I were to add on <clears throat> another attribute, such as first name, it's not an identifier, so it doesn't get underlined. Pretty straightforward concept. Okay. So, we keep identifying attributes. So basically put, we identified the keys. We want to make sure that we have all the attributes essential to the system uh, without trying to match them to particular entities. Uh, the best way to do this is to study the forms, files, reports currently being used by the company. Um, 
this is something that's becoming more rare because more and more companies are using off-the-shelf solutions or they're hiring an integrator to build it for them. Um, but there's still the odd case where you are given a big stack of information and you got to parse through that information trying to identify the important pieces. Um, so basically put, you when you're looking at the data, especially if it's working with paper, and believe it or not, paper is a really good tool for this. You can sit there and cross out what's not going to be transferred. So you eliminate what's no longer needed. Because often when you go from an old system to a new system, there might be roughed crap that's left behind from the old way of doing things that you might not need anymore. <clears throat> things like signatures or information that's constant on for all the forms. For example, your company's name and address. That's not something you need to model. Because if it doesn't have if it's the same on everything, why would you model that? So then once you're done, you'd circle the things that are that need to be kept across. And then you go round, then you do a round robin with all the employees that that are involved, also known as the stakeholders, and you go through it with them, and you go, Am I missing anything? And they'll look at you and go, Well, you crossed that out, but we actually do still use that. Or see that one that's circled there? We haven't used that in 10 years. I'm actually in the process of that at my day job now. We have a system that's been around for about 12 years. And a couple of people have said, well, there's a bunch of fields in here that we haven't used in, you know, eight years when we stopped physically shipping software on CDs and we moved over to flash drives because the flash drives were costing us less than CDs were. <laughs> Go figure that one out. You know, an eight gig stick costs less than a single blank DVD. That's because nobody sells them anymore, so they get expensive. Um, so when that transition happened, there's certain things we don't need anymore, but the, nobody has updated the UI. Nobody's hiding these fields because they're there. So we, that's part of the refresh is we're going to go through and identify what is no longer ever needed. So and the last item here is in the block of text we had, we identified that we were tracking the names and some numbers. So. For each attribute, we need to match it with exactly one entity. So in other words, if we say there's an employee name, it probably belongs to the employee. It doesn't belong to the supervisor. It doesn't belong to the project. The project name belongs to the project and not to the employee. So once we've identified the attributes, they're going to get mapped to entities, and they should only ever belong to one entity. If you have attributes that are left over, you probably miss something somewhere. In other words, you're missing an entity. You're missing a relationship. Uh, or you might have an entity that's left over that could belong to more than one thing. At that point, you need to re-examine what you understand of the system and maybe have some conversation with some of the stakeholders to make sure that everybody understands what it is, including yourself. So using a similar grid, we have attributes and entities. So the department name belongs to the department. Employee number and name belongs to employee. Same thing with supervisor and project. So then if this diagram is actually a little more fattened up than the other one because it does one more thing, which I haven't discussed yet. However, we can still identify these objects right here. So we've got the supervisor. We have the name and the number, the department with the name. The employee has a name and number. Uh, and then we got the project with a project number. And we could have a name on that too if we wanted. Um, what we did do, though, is we also broke out the many-to-many -many relationships. We ask that phrase, the proper phrase is we resolved the many to many relationship. So if we go back four slides, we see how department and employee is many to many, and employee to project is many to many, right? Physically in a database, that is impossible to do. Database servers do not let you do that. It, what it does do is it wants you to create what's called an associative entity. This one right here and this one right here. So you'll see that departments feeds into this. So the department has zero or more employee departments. And each employee department is one and only one department. Um, each employee has one or more of these, but only one and one here. And same thing with the employee to project. It does another entity. Uh, and then basically the attributes of 
the social of entities are the primary keys of the other two tables. The easy way to visualize the process is, you know, when you got a crow's foot, it's like this, right? You've got a crow's foot at both ends. When you're resolving it, it should actually become like this. So instead of the crow's foot pointing to each entity on the outsides, in the end, the crow's foot will point to an entity on the inside with singles on the outside. And if you don't get it, try doing the motion, you'll be surprised that it makes actually makes sense if you start flapping your arms around like a chicken like I just did. So essentially, a many-to-many -many relationship becomes a one-to-many, one-to-many. So if it's many, many on the outside, what you want it to be is one on the outside, many on the inside. And it creates an associative entity just like that. So that whole big paragraph of text gave us that diagram all said and done. Like that's the final form of an conceptual diagram for this. And then the last step is you check. And it's checking a diagram is very comparable to when you proofread your assignments in school. Or, you know, when you go to submit your programming assignments, the, you have a series of things you're supposed to accomplish and you go through that list of things you're supposed to accomplish and you make sure you're doing all those things. I don't know how um, anal retentive your programming props are in this program, but let me tell you, the CP and the CET students suffer. Um, they're like, oh, you didn't call this variable the right thing. It must have five variables. If you have four variables, you lose points, even though you didn't need the fifth variable. So when you're doing a diagram, you have to step back and take a look at it. So the first thing is, try to put yourself in the shoes of who's going to look at it. And is it is everything clear? Is In other words, does any of this not make sense? If it doesn't make sense, that needs to be fixed. Then you're going to check through the cardinality pairs, comparing it to your business rules that you define, make sure that the rules and the diagram match up. And then you go through the list of attributes associated with each entity to see if anything, anything's been missed. So you look at the attributes and the entities, Everything's there, everything's on the diagram. Congratulations, it's a success. Now, when you're converting a conceptual diagram to a physical diagram, which I will do as an example towards before the break, because there's a day where we have a review, but really the review takes like 15 minutes, 20 minutes. So after that, I'm actually gonna do a start to end design process. I just don't have a lot of whiteboard in here to do it. So that's going to be unfortunate because <laughs> uh, I've been known to use like six whiteboards when I do this. So it's going to be special. But when we convert a conceptual diagram to physical diagram, what you're going to do is you take all the entities, turn them into tables. You take all the single valued attributes, they each become columns. Uh, key attributes become the primary keys. If there's anything that is multi-valued, we break them out as a separate table. So a list of skills, for example. At the conceptual side, that is completely allowed. Because it's a concept, right? You go, ah, oh, this employee has a list of skills. We're not gonna necessarily create an entity for skills yet. We just know that the employee has skills. And there are actually symbols for that. Um, if I were to add another attribute here and we call it uh, skills, and it's a multi-valued, we have a symbol for that. It's kind of cool. It's a double ellipsis. It's just showing that there's many of these. And opposite attributes become separate columns. So again, I'm going to add another one here. I'm going to call it address. And it's a composite. A composite is drawn with parentheses. And that's saying that it's made up of multiple pieces. An address is an example of a composite attribute. Most people think, what's your address? Automatically, we, as a human, because our human brains are surprisingly good at assuming things. We know that an address is not one thing. There's a street address, a city, a political region, whether it's a state, a province, a county. We have um, a postal code of some sort, a country. Uh, there may be an address too. And depending what part of the world you come from, the rules change a little bit. Like in England, 
Uh, there used to be that they had two city fields for all addresses because England is special that way. They still have addresses like this, but now they just have like really long town names. Like literally you'd have an address where it's Wilthashire near some other shire. That was the name of, that's the name of the town where the mail gets delivered. And there are still places like that on their mailing addresses. So you'd have two city addresses. In North America, it's common to have two street address fields. 123 Some Street, Apartment 5, Suite 101, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, some of these pieces of the composite change depending on where you're at. It's all good. Who cares? But it's known as a composite attribute. So you take the composite attribute, you break it out to its own components. Actually, what's really cool about this particular tool is we can add component attributes, which is not a common um, feature that you see in a lot of these design tools. And suddenly we have a grouping that moves together. It's a really good tool for this to visualize. I'm not expecting that from you guys, but you know, that's how you draw a fully described composite attribute. You would ignore derived attributes unless you need to have it for performance reasons. What is a derived attribute? Can anybody in here take a guess what a derived attribute is? Not necessarily another table, but from an, something else in the database. It is anything that can be calculated as math with where all the variables of the equation reside within the database. A perfect example of that is a line total. A product has a price, it has a discount, it has a quantity, it might have a tax applied to it. How do you cal cal calculate the line total? Quantity minus discount times, I'm mean, sorry, price minus discount times quantity plus tax equals line total. And you calculate the tax, and usually the tax is stored somewhere else in the database also. But that is how you calculate a line total. How do you calculate an order total? You add up all the line totals. These are derived attributes. Another perfect example of a derived attribute is a person's age. Never, ever, ever, please, never, ever store a person's age. Store their date of birth. Why? You do the date. Now, minus date of birth equals age. Date, date and time math is terrible, by the way. It really sucks. It's like one of the worst things on earth. Get the computer to do it for you. Don't try to do it yourself. However, you can calculate age by taking the current date, subtracting the date of birth. Otherwise, what you have to do if you store a person's age is every year on their date of birth, you have to update that field. And you already have the date of birth. So why the hell would you store the age? Now, going back to storing derived attributes for performance reasons, line to like ordered line totals, order totals are often things that are stored calculated, even though you don't need it. Why? Because it's heavy to calculate. If you're in a low volume business, and by low volume, I'm talking, you know, 40,000 transactions a day or less. Most database engines nowadays are more than fast enough to do the math on the fly. If you're Amazon, you don't want to be doing that math every single time somebody says, okay, I'm a, uh, crappy knockoff product seller on Amazon. I want to go see what my sales for the day were. I'm going to run a report or the sales for yesterday because they don't they don't let you do real-time daytime sales, but they want to go see what yesterday's sales were. It's going to hit up pre-calculated columns and not calculate on the fly because it they just have so much freaking data that it's, it's not something that's reasonable to do. Um, like one of the systems at my day job, I'm actually storing all the calculated values so that I can do um, canned reports that run really, really fast. Um, like,
There, how fast was that? That loaded instantly. That's because I'm storing pre-calculated values. And this is actually calculating values from about the way back from 2011, and it's doing it, you know, that fast. I'm pre-storing pre-calculated values so that the database engine doesn't need to do this math, neither does the, the web server behind it. You know, it's cool. <laughs> There's a reason why you do store the derived values. And I mean, if I want to just do a quick and dirty report, there, that's, you know, how quick the report runs. How many rows of data in there? I don't know. December is actually a slow month for them, so there's not that much. But I could go with total units sold, and you know it loads up almost as fast. So they don't sell a lot of product. It's just really expensive product. So, but that's an example. Um, and the last step is assigning data data types. So by now you guys should know what data types are. If you're level two, if you don't know what a data type is. You should probably go back to level one. Uh, although, mind you, Python is typeless, or at least it used to be. It's getting a little more picky about types, but you know, it's like PHP. Data types are optional, unless you tell it to not be optional. Um, so yeah, so you assign the data types, and then you create create a physical diagram. And if we were to take that original um, item, and by the way. That's not even following my naming conventions. Somebody else drew this diagram, as you can tell. Uh, they're not even following consistent naming conventions. It, this diagram makes me really angry every time I see it. But I only need to see it once per term. So, but this is what that, so if we go back to this, that becomes that, but it's got the relationships as such. Um, without the projects, it's missing a piece. But it's, it shows you an example of, you know, it's got the data types, and of course they've got like camel case here and uppercase there, and you know, partial snake case there, and that's also known as angry snake because it's a little bit screaming. Um, different data types, you know, are associated. So yeah, so that's that. Now, um, for lab two, some people were having trouble, I guess, not the right word, wrapping their brains about what task one and task two is about. Putting it out there right now, that there is no right or wrong answer for task one and two. What it is, is you taking a point and explaining why you think it is. Is it a database, yes or no? And then you tell me why you picked either yes or no. That's all. So don't overthink it. It's not meant to be a particularly difficult lab. Just take a deep breath, calm down, and you. Don't overthink it. Just yes or no, and you tell me why you think that is. And that's it. And you don't need to demo it. It's demoed online, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it's all good. Outside of that, guys, that's the end for today. So we are now officially caught up to where we're supposed to be, which is good. And I will uh, see you guys either in lab or next week as applicable.